From Whitehall, London, this is the Rusi Analysis Podcast. Hello and welcome to Rusi Analysis Podcasts. I'm Jonathan Isle, Assistant Director here at the Institute. Earlier this week, I talked to Juan Arungescu, NATO's spokesperson, on the eve of uh, President Donald Trump's inauguration in Washington, about the challenges facing the alliance and about how America and its European allies could reinvigorate their transatlantic security relationship. Wana, very nice to hear you, to have you with us in our podcast. Good to be with you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Let, let's start straight away with uh, uh, U.S. President-elect uh, Donald Trump. Now, in his latest statements in Europe, uh, the president-elect has acknowledged the importance of NATO, but he has reiterated his aspiration uh, that NATO probably will need uh, to be reformed, as he put it. Now, uh, is it... Is history, the fact that this is a long-standing alliance dating back to the Cold War, is it a hindrance for the alliance? Or is it, as Mr. Trump has suggested, a perfectly legitimate subject for discussion? Well, NATO, of course, uh, was founded almost 70 years ago. And since then, it's it's gone through uh, several key inflection points. Uh, obviously, 49, the years of its creation, uh, then uh, until 89, uh, the Cold War, uh, when uh, NATO protected and, and defended uh, Western Europe uh, with a very clear adversary in the Soviet Union. And then, of course, in 89, uh, everything changed and NATO showed... Uh, that uh, it could adapt because at that time, you will remember, the mantra was out of area or out of business. Uh, so uh, NATO um, uh, played uh, its full role uh, in uh, stopping the bloodshed in Bosnia. It then, for the first time in its history, um, invoked Article 5 uh, of its founding treaty, the Collective uh, Defense Article, um, when the US was attacked on 9-11. Uh, and that uh, was the origin of our long-standing operation in Afghanistan. Um, so NATO continued to, to adapt throughout the decades. Um, and, of course, then we saw 2014, um, which is another key inflection point. And we have seen NATO continuing uh, to adapt uh, in quite major ways um, with um, the uh, the most uh, significant strengthening of its collective defence since the end uh, of the Cold War. Uh, we uh, are now on track to deploy four robust multinational battalions uh, to the Baltics and Poland. Um, so there is a lot going on which shows that NATO is adapting. We're also adapting in terms of um, uh, projecting stability uh, into our southern neighbourhood, uh, for instance, uh, with um, uh, training for uh, Iraqi officers in Jordan, and now we're establishing uh, a presence in Iraq also for training, uh, and of course with our continued uh, operation in Afghanistan to train, advise and assist the Afghan forces. So there's a lot that NATO is doing to adapt. However, uh, President-elect Trump has also uh, raised the point of burden sharing uh, in terms of defence spending. Um, and that is uh, an issue which uh, he discussed with uh, the Secretary General uh, when uh, they spoke uh, on the phone uh, after uh, his election. And the Secretary General, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, made very clear uh, that he absolutely agrees um, with mm. Mr Trump on this. So, uh, so uh, this is a classic case where perhaps a bit more of an honest discussion is welcome. Now, the sec what can the Secretary General, given his position, do uh, in order to not mediate but moderate this debate, namely channel the debate about burden sharing into something that is productive, into something that doesn't name and shame individual nations but actually creates a consensus Census for a bigger or better division of labour within the alliance? 
Well, that's clearly a very important part um, of the job of any Secretary General. And for Jens Stoltenberg, this is particularly important and very close to his heart uh, because uh, he's a statistician. He uh, was also a finance minister of his country, Norway, and he was a prime minister. Uh, and he um, sometimes recalls that as a prime minister in the 90s, he was among the European leaders who actually cut defence spending of his own country at the time because uh, it was normal, the Cold War was over, tensions were down, there was no reason to keep high uh, defence budgets. Now, of course, he says we must also remember that if it's OK to lower defence spending when tensions are down, we should also be prepared to raise defence spending when tensions are up, as we have seen uh, since 2014. Uh, and that's exactly actually what's been happening, Jonathan. You'll, you'll remember that um, at the Wales summit in 2014, uh, NATO leaders committed to stop the cuts and gradually increase defence spending uh, to meet the NATO gu guideline of spending 2% uh, on defence uh, within the decade. Now, we publish uh, the figures every year in the Secretary General's annual report. And we saw that in the year after the Wales summit in 2015, defence cuts basically stopped across Europe and Canada, and we started seeing a small increase. Uh, that continued throughout 2016, um, when 22 allies were projected to increase defence spending, uh, and we expect an increase of uh, around 3% in real terms. As you know, four European countries are already um, at 2%, UK, of course, uh, Poland, Estonia and Greece. But there are also others who are on the path to 2%, including um, Latvia, Lithuania and Romania. So after years of going into the wrong direction, we have started to go into the right direction. But if your question is, are we there yet? No, of course not. There's still a long way to go. Uh, the picture is mixed. We've seen some encouraging signs, but the Secretary General, like NATO leaders, will continue to monitor and review these figures very carefully. And I can tell you that this is a point that he raises uh, in every NATO capital he visits with every NATO leader he meets. Indeed, and to all his contributions in the media as well. Now, let us turn, if I may, to relations with Russia. Um, and uh, there has been some progress on the NATO-Russia Council um, in the last six months or so, although not much of it has been discussed in the media, and I think it's fair to say that relations remain tense. Um, now, uh, where do you think the alliance is in its relations with Russia at the moment? and especially the latest wave of accusation from official and semi-official Russian media networks uh, that our deployments in the Baltic states or elsewhere in the new member states of the alliance are, quote, provocative. Well, as, you, as you've said, we have had uh, last year uh, several meetings of the NATO-Russia Council. This is uh, the forum that brings together all 29, uh, NATO uh, and Russia, around the same uh, table. Um, and the last meeting was held in, in December. Um, and... Uh, it, it was uh, held uh, in, in an atmosphere that was quite constructive within um, the, the general atmosphere of the, of the relationship, which, as you say, uh, remains very difficult. It's worth remembering that for two decades uh, after the end of the Cold War, NATO actually aspired to build a partnership with Russia, including through uh, the NATO-Russia Council. Uh, I remember that in 2010, at the Lisbon summit, we met with President Medvedev and we said we aspired to a strategic partnership. And we're working on many areas together, um, including air safety, uh, counterterrorism and Afghanistan. And in fact, in 2014, uh, we were about to launch our first joint operation within the NATO-Russia Council. This was NATO and Russia together going to protect the US ship, the Cape Ray, that was going to destroy Syria's chemical weapons. Now, of course, with the legal annexation of Crimea uh, and the continued destabilization of Ukraine, all of this uh, came 
to a, a halt. Uh, Russia had torn up the international rule book, had undermined the principles of our partnership. So in 2014, NATO suspended practical cooperation with Russia, but decided to keep open the lines of political dialogue. And it's in within that framework that we have held um, various meetings of the NATO-Russia Council since. And some of the issues um, that are discussed in the Council uh, are really uh, quite important. That's uh, ways to increase military transparency and reduce uh, risks, and that's an ongoing um, discussion. Now, what we are doing and what we have been doing since 2014, including the uh, strengthening of NATO presence in the east of the alliance, um, is not aimed to provoke a conflict. It's to protect our allies, it's to prevent conflict, to preserve the peace. It's defensive. It's proportionate. It's in line with our international commitments. It's our job to defend our allies when the security situation has changed uh, so dramatically as it has. I understand. Uh, on the subject of the NATO-Russia Council, do you, I mean, one had uh, from a variety of sources all the time in Russia, uh, sort of accusations that they don't find the forum very adequate, that it forces them to sit across the table with a phalanx of countries, most of which they consider as not being very friendly to Russia. Uh, do you think there's any other format? Do you think the format is the problem or the problem is much more? much deeper? Well, I think um, this has been a format uh, which has had its ups and downs, but which was designed uh, as an all-weather for, uh, format, when times are good and when times are bad, uh, as they are now. Uh, so I think the fact that all 29 uh, have agreed to hold several meetings, actually three meetings last year in this format, um, where they discussed the security situation in Ukraine. Uh, they discussed uh, the, the situation in and around Afghanistan, including uh, the regional threats of terrorism. And they discussed uh, risk reduction and transparency, for instance, uh, in the Baltic Sea. This shows uh, that there are important issues to be discussed and that all 29 actually find merit in discussing them together. And it is fair to say that there were some misgivings about the 20, between the 29 countries about the wisdom of having these meetings. But as you say, at the end, they did come to the table. It's, it's part, if I may just quickly, it's, it's uh -huh. part of this uh, double track policy, which NATO has had from the start uh, of strong defense, but also openness to dialogue. Because obviously, when tensions are high, it makes sense that we should be speaking to each other to avoid avoid uh, any uh, misunderstandings, to make very clear what we are actually doing, uh, how we are doing it, why we are doing it, including in terms of exercises. For instance, Russia has held some very large scale exercises, continues to hold SNAP exercises, um, which uh, uh, use loopholes uh, in OSC uh, documents. So there are a lot of issues to be discussed out there. Indeed. Let me turn in the last few remaining minutes to more, more specifically, if you wish, bailiwick to your job. Uh, now, there's been a lot of discussion about the post-truth age and about the sort of advent of fake news, news of items that have never happened. Uh, that, all this puts an enormous amount of pressure on your uh, outfit, your responsibility. How do you personally see your role? Is your personal role just to rebut and demolish, dismantle some of the arguments that are put about NATO, some of the fake news that is put about the alliance? Or would you consider that NATO requires a more active news management and engagement uh, with the public? Well, I think... Uh We've been uh, very proactive. Um, we have quite a small uh, team here at NATO headquarters uh, uh, in, in the press office uh, un under 
10 press offices uh, in, in a press office of about uh, 30 people altogether. Uh, so it's not a huge team, but I think we've been quite uh, quite active uh, since the start because we, sto we saw uh, since 2014 quite a massive increase um, in the amount of uh, propaganda, um, disinformation about NATO, uh, trolling uh, on social media platforms. Uh, our basic principle is that we will not counter propaganda with propaganda. Uh, we do so um, with facts, with information, with engagement and with confidence in our own values. So we fight as who we are because were we to uh, choose the path of propaganda, uh, frankly, that would make it very easy uh, for uh, Russia and perhaps others to say, see, they're just as bad as, as we are, uh, everybody's lying. And that is exactly um, the aim that we see uh, in a lot of the disinformation that is out there, to poison the well to confuse people about what is fact and what is fiction or fake news um, and to divide uh, people out there, to make them um, doubt the existence of objective truth and of, of object, objective facts. So um, we think that it's important uh, that First of all, we place uh, the, the facts on, on the table. And of course, uh, we will also, when we see some egregious uh, cases of disinformation, uh, take to Twitter, as I sometimes do, uh, to ask uh, Russia Today or Sputnik or others um, to actually change their stories because they are patently wrong. Uh, we also have um, a sort of one-stop shop uh, on the NATO website, which is called Setting the Record Straight, a portal um, which lists a lot of the Russian myths with the arguments of why they are myths, they are disinformation. Um, and, of course, we engage with journalists, um, uh, not just from NATO countries, but also from Russia, from Ukraine and elsewhere, um, where we handle thousands of media queries from journalists from all over the world. And we invite uh, Russian journalists to come to our events, to ministerial meetings, to speak to the Secretary General, because we are transparent. We have nothing to hide. Uh, we are also stepping up cooperation with the European Union, uh, so we're, we're coordinating um, with them. Um, and, uh, of course, we also count on journalists, on social media platforms, uh, to do their jobs, to cut through the the fiction and the fake news and to fact check. And I'm very pleased to see that, for instance, now uh, Facebook is introducing new tools to do just that. And so are um, uh, media outlets such as the BBC, The Voice of America and others. Yes, I remember the quick response time that you had to the uh, particularly egregious story like uh, the that the new headquarters of the alliance look like an SS symbol if seen from above. Yeah, which is uh, it's actually interlacing fingers, but um, yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, how much of it is done up to national governments of member states? I mean, do you see how, how do you fit with media operations of national governments? of member states? Well, of course, we coordinate very closely with our colleagues uh, from all the 28 uh, allies here in uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels, but also with our military colleagues um, across uh, NATO, uh, because NATO uh, is and remains a political military alliance. But as you suggest in your question, I think a key role to play is not just to a small press office in Brussels, even though, of course, we'd be very happy if we could get more resources. Um, but I think it is uh, for, for capitals, uh, for politicians, uh, for uh, opinion makers, for journalists in each and every of our NATO allies to make the case, to ask the questions, to check the facts. 
Thank you so much. Um, and a final question. When uh, do you think we will get the opportunity of welcoming President Trump for the NATO summit? Is it going to be when the new headquarters are open? Do we have any clear idea on the exact dates? Um, well, NATO's next summit will take place in Brussels this year. That's a decision of the uh, taken by uh, NATO leaders at the Warsaw uh, summit in uh, last July. Um, the date isn't uh, yet set, uh, so uh, there are now ongoing consultations between allies on the timing, uh, on the agenda, and of course we'll have to to wait for um, the inauguration uh, of the new uh, U.S. president on the 20th of January to um, uh, for those consultations to enter their final stages. But um, Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg uh, told uh, President-elect Trump that he's looking forward to welcoming him uh, um, uh, to um, Brussels. Of course, there's a lot to be discussed about the continued adaptation of, of NATO to uh, this changed security environment, this age of uncertainty that we live in. Um, President Trump confirmed that he would uh, attend the, the summit. Um, and, of course, it will send in itself, um, the, the summit will send in itself a message of uh, unity uh, between uh, Europe and North America with all 29 leaders um, coming together. I say uh, 29 because, of course, uh, we are also in the final stages of the ratification of Montenegro's uh, accession to NATO. But, of course, um, whether it's 29 members uh, or 28 members um, and uh, and uh, an, an observer, an invited uh, member, that still remains to be seen. But anyway, uh, it, uh, it should be an important summit. Indeed. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, President Trump would be welcomed in a new shiny uh, headquarters of the alliance may be a reminder to all of us that even though the alliance is seven decades old, it could be just seven decades young. Uh, Juan Alunjescu, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for giving us your time. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. For more analysis, publications and research, visit www.rusi.org.